Restless legs is an extremely common and highly distressing neurologic and sleep disorder, affecting to a moderate or severe degree up to 2% of the population. We have previously published two prior algorithms, the last one in 2013, so it's seven years ago, and we thought the time with new advances had come to update this algorithm, which we have extensively rewritten and modified. We have recognized many of the dangers of dopaminergic medication in restless legs. We know more about intravenous iron. There are some more controlled studies of treatment modalities, and we understand a lot better the use of low-dose opioids for refractory restless legs. I'm Dr. Mike Silber. I work in the Center for Sleep Medicine and the Department of Neurology at Mayo Clinic, but in this paper, I'm representing the Scientific and Medical Advisory Board of the National Restless Leg Syndrome Foundation. Um, I will be talking about a manuscript that will soon be published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Um, the manuscript is entitled Management of Restless Leg Syndrome, an Updated Algorithm. Over the seven years, a lot of new developments have occurred. I would like to summarize some of the conclusions that we reach in this new algorithm. There are really three main topics. The first deal with iron therapy, the second with a new approach to the management of chronic um, persistent restless legs, and the third, an update on the use of opioids. So let's start a little with iron therapy. We know that restless legs is associated with low iron stores in the brain, although the exact detailed pathophysiology has not been fully elucidated. Regrettably, we can't measure iron stores in the brain reliably, at least clinically at the moment. So we have to use as a surrogate marker levels in the blood, and we know that is not necessarily a direct correlation. So we recommend that every patient with restless leg syndrome has serum ferritin measured and a percentage transferrin saturation. We like serum ferritin to be above 75, ideally, for full control of restless legs. And we recommend generally oral iron therapy if it is below that level. A new advance is that it's now been noted that iron should not be given more frequently than once a day and perhaps once every second day, giving it as was recommended in the past two to three times a day actually impairs absorption. The other advance in iron is much more experience with intravenous iron. The indications for intravenous iron would be someone who's got low iron stores or iron deficient and has malabsorption syndromes and can't absorb oral iron, or who is intolerant to oral iron, or has such severe restless legs, we really want to replenish iron stores fast. Or finally, somebody who's, or whose iron is between 75 and 100 level of ferritin in the blood because above 75, oral iron will not get absorbed. We discuss in the algorithm various forms of intravenous iron, such as ferric carboxymaltose or low molecular weight iron dextran. Generally, these are given as a single infusion, very simply. We, it's not successful in everybody, probably a 60% success rate, but when it works, it can be life transforming. Um, we then start looking at restless legs um, at different levels of severity. And figure one talks about intermittent restless legs and its management, often non-pharmacologic therapy, and then on-demand medications such as levodopa, benzodiazepines, and low-potency opioids. Not much has changed there. But when we go to figure two, which is chronic persistent restless legs, which is restless leg syndrome present at least twice a week and causing at least moderate distress, um, then the approach has changed. Um, we are now recommending the first-line therapy for most patients are alpha-2-delta calcium ligands such as gabapentin or pregabalin or gabapentin and a carbol rather than the dopamine agonists. And the reason is we now recognize that 40 to 70% of patients who take dopamine agonists such as pramipexol or ropinirole or rotigotine will with time develop augmentation in which increasing doses causes worse restless legs rather than less. The restless legs move earlier in the day, they can spread to the arms and become less, and the drug becomes less effective at night. 
Um, also, they, in a minority of patients, they can cause impulse control disorders. Now, the alpha-2 delta calcium ligands are not without their own difficulties. They don't cause augmentation, but they are associated with depression and obesity and unsteadiness and cognitive impairment in the elderly. So one has to look carefully at contraindications before deciding they are the first-line therapies. If they are felt to be contraindicated, of course, the dopamine agonists are used. We then discuss the management of augmentation. And generally, we would try to get the patient off the dopamine agonist and use, if they haven't already used an alpha-2 delta ligand and it's failed, we try that next. We replenish iron stores. But if all that doesn't work, we are absolutely clear that most patients are candidates for low-dose opioid therapy, which is shown in figure three. Um, you see here the first approaches we use, but at the end is consider opioid monotherapy. Now, obviously, we are in a clinical environment today in which physicians are recommended not to use chronic opioids for most conditions. But I would emphasize a few points. Restless legs is not chronic pain. It's a different pathophysiology. Second, there are long-term follow-up studies showing very little tolerance and very little dependence producing effect. Third, we use much lower doses. For instance, oxycodone, the average would be 20 milligrams a day. Um, and there are now control trials showing that opioids do work for refractory disease. And it, for anyone who's used them for refractory restless legs, you cannot believe how pleased the patients are, how devastating this severe form of the disease can be. Patients become suicidal. Um, sleep is deprived more than perhaps any other disorder. People are down to one or two hours sleep a night in severe cases. And with opioids, their whole life can be transformed. But of course, it should be for refractory restless legs only with careful precautions, looking at addiction risk, looking at advising on side effects, monitoring carefully, opioid contract, urine drug screens, consulting state um, uh, lists of medications prescribed at regular intervals. We're very, very careful and we discuss all this in the paper. Now, quite finally, two other new things that we've put into the paper. We now have sections specifically on pregnancy, lactation, childhood, and renal failure, and a section at the end on advances in treatment, future experimental treatments, including mechanical and electrical therapies, and possible future drugs, as well as a brief paragraph on what we do or don't know about cannabis. Um, this paper is intended predominantly for primary care physicians, but we really think it will be helpful also for neurologists and sleep specialists who manage these patients, especially the more difficult ones. I hope it's going to be very helpful for the management of this really severe and disabling disorder. Thank you. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter more information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.